Um, uh, I will go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the 40th Annual uh, Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. Um, my name is Edward Nunez. I am a 1L PILC representative, and I will be moderating this panel, uh, Mink Fur Farming, uh, Threat to Public Health and Wildlife. Um, I just have a few announcements before we get underway. Uh, first, um, don't worry if you can't see yourself. This is a Zoom webinar. So only the attendees, so all the attendees will be automatically muted with videos off. Um, you will only be able to see the panelists. Uh, throughout the panel, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function rather than the chat function. Um, all of our panelists will be giving their presentation and there will also be a 15 minute uh, Q&A session at the end where the panelists will be able to answer questions. Um, Please remember to be courteous to all viewpoints throughout the presentation and throughout the Q&A session. Uh, additionally, if there are any legal professionals in the audience um, wanting to earn CLE credit for this, uh, we will be dropping the link for that um, farther into the panel so people can view that and look at the instruction. Um, also, our alumni board, uh, Friends of Land, Air, Water, uh, help to provide stipends for students doing unpaid public interest environmental law. Um, internships. So if you're interested in making a donation, we will also be providing a link for that as well. Uh, lastly, uh, the University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Liki. Uh, this is the traditional homeland of the Kalapuya people. And following treaties between 1851 and 1855, um, the Kalapuya people were depossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States um, and forcefully removed to the coast reservation of Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederate tribes of the Grand Road community of Oregon um, and Confederate tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon. And they continue to make important contributions to their communities, to the University of Oregon and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. Um, so Pilk would like to acknowledge the traditional homeland, homelands of the Kalapuya people in the Willamette Valley. Um, and express our respect for the tribal nations of Oregon. So with that being said, I would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Zach Strong, a uh, senior staff attorney with the Animal Welfare Institute. Hi there, Zach. Uh, his focus is on protecting and serving terrestrial wildlife in, in captivity and in the wild through litigation, legislation, and regulatory reform, and promoting uh, human wildlife coexistence. We have Hannah Connor with us, uh, who is a senior attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. Hello there, Hannah. Uh, her work focuses on protecting endangered species, waterways, workers, and communities from toxic threats like pesticides, factory farms, and destructive mining operations. Um, we have Kate uh, Dilowski, uh, who is a senior policy advisor uh, at the Animal Welfare Institute. Uh, she advocates for legislation to protect animals at the federal and state levels, uh, including bills on captive exotic animals, wildlife trafficking, and trapping, among other issues. Uh, and last but not least is uh, Jillian Leons. Uh, she is the, region, uh, the Director of Regulatory Affairs at the Humane Society Legislative Fund, uh, where she works with federal agencies, including the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Department of Human uh, health and Human Services to champion the Im implementation and enforcement of federal regulations that support the protection of animals. Um, so with that being said, I think you all have heard enough of me. I will go ahead and pass things on to our panelists. Um, I'm sure we are all very much looking forward to their presentation. So y'all take it away. Thanks so much, Edward. I will share my screen and get us started. Just one second. Can you guys see that? Perfect, okay. So as Edward mentioned, I am the Director of Regulatory Affairs at the Humane Society Legislative Fund, and my colleagues and I are here today to talk to you about the fur farming industry in the United States and abroad, why the industry raises concerns for public health and wildlife, and how the United States and other countries have responded to outbreaks of COVID-19 on mink fur farms. 
We will then summarize efforts to reform the industry through legislation and regulatory changes at the state and federal levels. So I'm going to kick us off here by just giving you some background on the mink fur farming industry in the United States and abroad and the concerns the COVID-19 pandemic has raised about the industry. So to start, over 100 million animals, including minks, rabbits, raccoon dogs, foxes, and chinchillas, are killed worldwide for their fur every year. This includes millions of mink that are raised in captivity and killed each year in industrial farms across North America, Europe, and Asia. So in the United States, there are really only two sources of information on mink farming, one of which is the USDA's five-year agricultural census, which by its name, you can see is conducted every five years. The last time it was released was in 2017. And according to that census, there were 236 mink farms in 18 states, with about two thirds of those farms being in Wisconsin, Utah, Idaho, and Oregon. So in 2017, those 236 farms housed between four and 5 million mink and produced 3.31 million mink pelts. So by comparison, if you're looking at this from a global perspective, in 2018, there were approximately 60 mink farms in Canada that produced 1.76 million pelts, 2,750 mink farms in Europe that produced 34 million pelts, and 8,000 mink farms in China that produced 20 million pelts. So, but what you can see here on this graph is that the industry is one in decline. So while we have those numbers from 2017, we also know that between 2017 and 2020, the number of mink pelts produced in the United States declined from that number of 3.31 million to 1.41 million. And the value of those pelts fell from about 120 million to 47 million. So additionally, the number of female mink bred on these farms to support the industry in the U.S. dropped from about 730,000 to about 320,000. So what you can see from that is that this is an industry that is in decline, but it's also obvious from those numbers that there are still millions of animals and millions of mink that are raised each year in captivity and killed for their fur. So you may ask, why are we here? Why are we at an environmental law conference and talking about mink? And I certainly don't need to tell anybody on this Zoom that since 2019, we've been living in a global pandemic. And as you all know, since its emergence in late 2019, the SARS-CoV-2 virus has caused a pandemic of respiratory disease known as COVID-19 that as of this week has sadly killed almost 6 million people worldwide. You probably also know that COVID-19 falls into the category of emerging infectious diseases known as zoonotic diseases, which are the diseases that are transmitted between humans and animals. What you may not know is that due to the zoonotic nature of COVID-19, numerous wild, captive, and domesticated species have proven susceptible to infection that ranges from your house cat to white-tailed deer to snow leopards to raccoon dogs to multiple species of mice. What you may also not know is that the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed what some of us have long known, and that's that the living conditions on fur farms, which keep animals in close proximity and at high densities are a hotbed for disease activity. Not only are these captive wild animals highly stressed and thus immunocompromised, but they're crowded into super close contact with each other's respiratory secretions. Industry representatives have themselves noted that the high densities at these farms has increased the chance of disease transmission. And while all species raised for their fur could potentially be vulnerable to and serve as you know, reservoirs for future zoonosis, in certain species, such as raccoon dogs and foxes, have proven susceptible to COVID-19, Captive mink have been shown over the past three years to be the most vulnerable non-human animal susceptible to catching and spreading COVID-19. And this is due to the conditions as I would just mentioned, the stressful conditions, close contact with each other, but it's also due to the human-like structure of something called their ACE2 receptor, which allows the SARS-CoV-2 virus to en effectively enter and bind with their cells. 
So because of this, since the beginning of the pandemic, about 20,000 captive mink on US farms have died from the disease. While in Europe, millions more have either died from the disease or been killed to prevent its spread. So it's clear that farmed mink can become infected with SARS-CoV-2 and that the virus can spread among them. There have been outbreaks on about 400 farms in North America, including at least 17 in the United States. And while of course it's horrifying at the risk the disease presents to mink and the resulting infection, death and culling, it's also important to note that the risk is not present only for the mink themselves. Farmed mink are unique not only in their susceptibility to the virus themselves, but also in their ability to transmit it. And to date, captive mink are the only animals verified to have transmitted the disease directly to humans. So mink to human spread of SARS-CoV-2, as you can see here, has been reported in numerous countries, including the Netherlands, Denmark, and Poland. It's also, as you can see on the slide, likely according to the CDC to have occurred in the United States. So there's obviously a risk between mink and humans, but there is also a risk between mink and wildlife. Mink regularly escape from captivity. They, they escape the conditions on the farms. And in both Utah and Oregon, wild mink captured around fur farms have tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. And there is also the possibility that farmed mink could transmit the virus to other species. And the industry has itself acknowledged that past disease outbreaks have been shown to be transmitted by wildlife that has accessed farms such as rodents. So the last point I will make here is that obviously there is a lot of risk and you might know that there is a vaccine for mink. However, it's highly unlikely that the vaccine would prevent transmission entirely. At this time, there is no publicly available data on the effectiveness of the vaccine in mink. But even if the vaccine were effective and 100% of mink in these countries were treated, it likely would not eliminate infection or spread entirely. As industry guidelines and documentation notes that even the best vaccination programs really only protect 90% of animals. So because of this risk, organizations throughout the world have issued some warnings, including the WHO, which flagged that they thought that there was a risk of virus spread in fur farms at the national level. And you can see on this slide, the red areas are where they thought that risk was the highest, including in the United States. The WHO has also stated that they believe the SARS-CoV-2 spillover from fur farms to humans poses a serious public health and socioeconomic threat. But they're not the only organization that has issued warnings. Other global health organizations, such as the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, the World Organization for Animal Health, and the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control have all issued similar warnings. So because of this risk and because of these warnings, countries throughout the world have taken action to prevent further transmission, including some countries that have unfortunately thought it was necessary to preventively cull millions of animals. So several European countries are already in the process of banning fur farming, including the United Kingdom, Austria, Croatia, and Estonia. And additionally, Slovakia, Norway, Belgium are phasing out fur farming and bans are under consideration in Montenegro, Bulgaria, Lithuania, and Ukraine. And the crisis itself has prompted both Denmark and Sweden to suspend mink fur production, the Netherlands to move up its deadline for ending mink production in that country to the end of this year, and France, Italy, and British Columbia, Canada to entirely ban fur production within those, mink fur production within those countries. And although Hungary does not currently have any mink farming, the country decided to proactively ban mink farms and other fur farms from coming into the country due to public health concerns about COVID-19. So the United States is a little bit different. We, have, we do not yet have any active bans. However, the USDA and the CDC have worked to issue guidance documents for industry that discussed recommended measures such as restricting access to fur farms where animals are kept, wearing protective face coverings, and minimizing contact with sick or dead animals. The agencies have also created guidance documents for public health and safety officials that discussed mitigation measures such as educating farm workers 
and recommended biosecurity measures to prevent the introduction of SARS-CoV-2 on Ming farms. The CDC has also issued guidance to, for importing and safely handling mink products. This guidance really looks at things like making sure that mink that are imported into the country are not coming from places with active SARS-CoV-2 mink infections. Also making sure that pelts that are imported into the country have been treated to make them non-infectious. And also recommendations that anybody that works with mink or mink products is fully vaccinated and wears full PPE when handling those products for mink. Additionally, the federal government has done some active monitoring on fur farms in their surrounding areas. And that includes this mink stamp program you can see over here on the right, which is a voluntary cooperative federal, state, and industry effort to monitor for SARS-CoV-2 on, on fur farms, and then also to basically track for any new variants. The idea behind that program is they're really trying to minimize the risk of transmission between mink and the humans that work with them. However, the one thing I will note here is that all of the actions in the United States are voluntary. These are guidance documents and farms do not necessarily have to participate in these programs. So because of that, experts have really expressed some concern that you know, these outbreaks have continued despite these measures and mink farms can serve as, continue to serve as reservoirs in human communities for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So a lot of people have been doing some work to try to encourage the United States to take additional actions on the regulatory and legislative side to really help prevent these reservoirs from existing within human communities. And I will pass to my colleague Kate now to, to kick us off on talking about that. Thanks, Jillian. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kate Deluski. I'm a senior policy advisor at the Animal Welfare Institute. And I am going to talk to you today about the congressional response to COVID-19 outbreaks on mink farms. So as Jillian said, zoonotic diseases are defined as pathogens that are transmissible between animals and humans. And I wanna just zoom out for a moment and talk about how Congress has addressed this within the past couple of years. Um, the science has long been clear about the dangers of diseases jumping from animals to humans. Um, even before COVID, we knew that approximately a quarter of deaths worldwide are caused by infectious, infectious diseases. And of these diseases, about 60% are considered zoonotic and more than 70% of those originate with wildlife. Uh, so we knew that there were dire implications to close contact with wildlife species. But as usual, Congress uh, takes a little while to catch up. And so it really took the COVID-19 pandemic to wake them up to the fact that this was a problem that needed to be addressed, not only for COVID, but also for the threat of future pandemics. And so to reduce the risk of a future pandemic, it's clear we need to reduce that contact between humans and wild animals. And so Congress has responded with a variety of proposed policies, including most notably the two bills that are listed here. Uh, the first one, the Preventing Future Pandemics Act, would ban live wildlife markets here in the United States and make their closure abroad a diplomatic priority. It would also provide resources for helping global communities transition to less risky food sources than wild animals. And it would provide additional law enforcement support to countries that need help combating wildlife trafficking. The second bill here, the Global Pandemic Prevention and Biosecurity Act would do a whole host of things, um, but notably it would establish a global zoonotic disease task force to promote and oversee the federal government's response to worldwide infectious disease outbreaks. And the sponsors of both of these bills specifically cite pandemic prevention as the main motivation 
for promoting these policies and trying to get these bills signed into law. So we see all of this energy in this space as we've dealt with COVID for the past couple of years. The question for our work is where do farmed mink fit into this congressional conversation? Um, mink that are raised for their fur have long sort of slipped between the cracks. They are wild animals, but they are also being raised and killed in these industrial farm settings as livestock are. And due to the difficulty of putting them into one clear category, they have been overlooked by government. There has not been adequate oversight. And so it is um, a bit of, it takes a bit of education to get Congress to realize that farmed mink need to be part of the conversation around reducing contact with wild species in order to pr protect public health. So as we have over the past couple of years worked toward this goal of letting Congress know mink should not be kept in such close confinement and making them willing to act on it, we've proposed three policy solutions that work in concert with one another. Um, these are part of a draft bill that has not yet been introduced and uh, we're continuing to work on making sure that all of these elements make it into legislation in Congress. So the first piece is the simplest, phase out mink farming in the United States. The science on this is really clear and Jillian did a great job of covering it. These mink farms can become reservoirs from which new mutations of COVID-19 spill back to humans. And at this point, we know that there is no safe way for mink farms to operate. There simply isn't. And so it's time for this industry to end. However, given that most of these farms are small and family operated, the legislation also has to include compensation for the loss of their livelihood. So the second piece here is that the USDA has to reimburse mink farmers for the fair market value of their farm as they transition to another type of work. And importantly, it's stipulated that this money could not be used for any other type of fur farming. And third, there's a severe lack of information on fur farming in the United States, whether it's of mink or any other species raised for fur. Um, for the most part, the government doesn't know where these farms are and does not adequately monitor them for the potential of zoonotic disease risk. And so more oversight is urgently needed and our proposed bill would create a system of fur farms registering or being licensed by the USDA. And Zach is going to discuss more about the need for this transparency and accountability during his presentation. So where are we at right now? Um, there has not yet been a bill that it, uh, addresses all three of these components introduced, um, but there has been some progress. The America Competes Act is a bill aimed at improving US innovation that passed the House of Representatives a few weeks ago. And there was an amendment included banning mink farming in the United States. So we don't know yet if this will become law. Um, the House and the Senate need to reconcile the two versions of this bill and the mink farming amendment is not in the Senate version. So it's uncertain whether this provision is gonna be in the final package that makes it to the president's desk, um, but there is potential for movement there. And finally, I want to touch briefly on appropriations, which is where this really gets a little wonky in the Congress talk, but um, the appropriations process is an annual procedure through which Congress funds the federal government. And these bills are often excellent vehicles for directing agency action, even though you're not really supposed to use them to create new powers for the agencies. And so this is just another avenue through which we have an opportunity to move the needle on this issue. 
And for fiscal year 23, which will be the next cycle that Congress works on, we have two requests for what we're hoping will be included in the agricultural appropriations language. The first is for USDA to create a report summarizing current fur farming in the United States. This includes the uh, number of farms, the geographic distribution, the species raised, and the extent to which fur farms are complying with the latest COVID-19 guidance from the government, which Jillian went over. Second ask is to provide funding to the National Agricultural Statistics Service within USDA to expand its annual survey of mink farms, which currently collects very minimal information to include far more detail on all fur farming in the United States. So this would provide a clear picture of this industry on a more ongoing basis. Um, so those are the current efforts in Congress. This was a very quick rundown. And as I'm sure you all know, nothing moves quickly in Congress. Reaching consensus on any issue is an uphill battle, but it's important to push these ideas in the halls of Congress to complement the regulatory and state strategies that my colleagues are discussing today. Because ultimately, if we're successfully going to address this animal welfare and public health crisis of COVID-19 on mink farms, it's going to take efforts on multiple fronts. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and pass it along. Great. Thanks, Kate. Go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, well, hi everyone. Um, thanks to Kate and Jillian for their presentations and thanks for everyone's interest in your panel, in this panel. Uh, I'm Zach Strong. I'm a senior attorney also with the Animal Welfare Institute. Uh, and I'm gonna pick up where Kate left off uh, and shift from our federal legislative work to some uh, regulatory uh, parallel work we've been doing in the context of mink and other fur farms. And so I'm going to touch on three areas we've been focusing on where federal agencies have an opportunity and the authority, if we can get them to exercise it, to oversee and regulate the fur farming industry, particularly when it comes to disease transmission. Um, those areas are information collection and, as we've heard, the need for the federal government to collect and share more information about the mink and fur industries with the public. Second, the uh, disease monitoring and prevention and the need for uh, greater disease surveillance by federal agencies. And third, uh, the international and interstate uh, trade and transport of mink and other wildlife. Regarding information collection, uh, as, as we've heard, we see this as a really important issue because of how little information is currently publicly available about uh, the mink and fur farm industry, despite the risks that it poses to public health and wildlife. Uh, we know that the USDA through NAS, the National Agricultural Statistics Service, does collect a very basic amount of information through its five-year census of agriculture, as, as Jillian mentioned, as well as through an annual mink survey. But the information collected is uh, very minimal. The five-year census uh, asks only three questions specific to mink. It asks for the number of live mink on the farm at the end of the census year, the number of live mink and pelts sold that year, and the total amount of sales. Um, Similarly, the annual mink survey also only asks three questions about mink, the number of pelts produced, the color of those pelts, and the number of females bred to produce kits. Uh, and that's it. Um, and we think it's critical for 
for the federal government to be collecting and sharing with the public much more information than that, particularly information related to the risk of disease transmission on these farms. So for example, the number of mink that may have become sick or died from disease on a farm in a given year, the number of mink sold or transferred to another farm and where they were transferred to, which could help with uh, identifying the origins of a, of a disease outbreak. A description of the perimeter fencing, if any, that may be used on a given farm to prevent mink from escaping or other wildlife from gaining access to the farm, both of which could result in disease transmission. Uh, how the farm disposes of manure and carcasses, which can harbor uh, viruses, including SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and finally, what steps a farm has taken to prevent the spread of pathogens into nearby water bodies, uh, which can also serve as a vector for disease transmission. And as we've uh, urged NAS in our comments and in our conversations with the agency, uh, it should be collecting and sharing this type of information not only about mink farms, but about all other types of fur farms in the country as well. Um, turning next then to disease monitoring and prevention, uh, just as the federal government should be gathering and publishing more information about the fur industry, it should also be doing more to actively monitor and prevent disease transmission on, on mink and other fur farms. And, and now it has an opportunity to do so. Uh, and that's because last year, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan Act, which uh, provided $300 million uh, to the USDA to conduct monitoring and surveillance of susceptible animals for incidents of SARS-CoV-2. Um, since that time, APHIS uh, has developed a framework outlining how it will use those funds um, disappointingly, the framework itself does not specifically mention mink or mink farms or the fur industry. Uh, but as Jillian mentioned, uh, late last year, the agency announced the development of a new program called the Mink Stamp Program uh, as part of that framework. Uh, Stamp stands for SARS-CoV-2 Transmission Avoidance and Monitoring Plan. And as Jillian mentioned, um, there's not a lot of information about the program available yet, but it would, sounds like it would enable APHIS to be more proactive in monitoring and preventing the spread of SARS-CoV-2 rather than just reacting to outbreaks that may be reported you know, by fur farms as we've seen uh, over the past couple of years. If, and it's a big if, states and mink farmers choose to participate in the program because it is voluntary. Um, we reached out to APHIS to uh, learn more about the program and learned that since December when the program was announced, so far only mink farms in Oregon have chosen to participate and that's apparently due to a, a temporary order issued by the Oregon Department of Agriculture requiring their participation. Uh, so it's, it's not clear uh, whether additional states or, or mink farms will choose to participate. It's also not clear to us how hard uh, APHIS will, will work to encourage other states or farms to participate. But you know, we see this program as a, as, a, as a new opportunity, an important opportunity to get APHIS and state agencies and mink farms involved in more proactive disease prevention efforts. So as we continue to communicate with federal agency and, and, and potentially the state agencies, we'll certainly urge them to do whatever they can to maximize participation in this program. And then third, turning to the regulation of, of trade uh, in mink and other wildlife. Um, here I'm gonna summarize a few rulemaking petitions that uh, have been submitted by various organizations um, in recent months to uh, uh, agencies that, 
that we believe can play a role in preventing disease transmission by restricting international and interstate trade in mink and mink products and other wildlife. Um, and so first, a, a few months ago, several of our groups petitioned the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to list mink as injurious under a statute called the Lacey Act, which was passed way back in 1900 and was actually the nation's first major federal wildlife statute. Um, one of the primary provisions of the Lacey Act prohibits the importation of wildlife species which the service deems injurious to humans, agriculture, or wildlife. Uh, and in fact, the service uh, has so far designated almost 800 species of mammals, birds, fish, and other taxa as injurious uh, under this provision. And so we argued that captive mink uh, are injurious in two ways. First, they're injurious to humans because they could infect humans with SARS-CoV-2. Um, as we've heard, that mink to human transmission has been documented in European countries and has likely occurred in the US as well. Uh, and second, captive mink, we argued, are injurious to wildlife, essentially because they escape from uh, fur farms. And infected escaped mink could transmit the virus to native mink or other wildlife, such as predators that may prey on escaped mink. Um, and in addition, escaped mink could harm native mink populations through hybridization, which results in offspring that are less fit and less likely to be able to survive in the wild. And in fact, this phenomenon has been documented uh, through a series of studies that have taken place over the last decade in Canada, one of which in 2017 found that nearly 60% of free ranging mink that they sampled uh, in Nova Scotia, where there are a number of mink farms, were either escaped captive mink or captive wild hybrids, a remarkably high percentage there. Um, and that's concerning because all of the states uh, where mink farms are located in the US overlap with the range of native mink uh, in the country, meaning that mink that escape, and we know they escape uh, fairly often, could uh, encounter and hybridize with, with native mink here. And uh, unfortunately, as far as we know, that issue has, has never been studied in the US. So we just don't know if that's going on, but uh, it's, it's just as likely to be occurring here as, as, as it is in Canada. Separately from that petition, uh, a couple of other groups filed a pair of petitions. Um, the Center for Biologically, Biological Diversity and Natural Resources Defense Council petitioned the service also under the Lacey Act, as well as the uh, CDC under what's called the Public Health Service Act. They took a, a broader approach and asked those agencies to prohibit the import and export of all wild mammals and birds and products derived from those species. Uh, we've talked about the authority that the Lacey Act gives the service. And similarly, the Public Health Service Act gives the CDC authority to prevent the introduction, transmission, or spread of communicable diseases. And the CDC has used that authority in the past to prohibit or restrict the importation of, of species uh, such as dogs and cats, turtles, uh, non-human primates. So it's helpful precedent and we hope that the agencies respond favorably to those petitions. And I wanted to mention one last statute uh, that some of our organizations are also considering petitioning under um, in the same way that the Lacey Act gives authority to the service and the Public Health Service Act gives authority to CDC. The uh, Animal Health Protection Act authorizes, in this case, APHIS uh, to prohibit or restrict the import, export, or interstate movement 
of any animal or article if it is necessary to prevent the introduction or dissemination of any pest or disease of livestock. Uh, the Act defines article as any material or tangible object that could harbor a pest or disease, and it defines livestock very broadly as all farm-raised animals. So we would request that APHIS prohibit or restrict the trade in all in, in live mink and mink articles or products, particularly those containing fur, which have been found to be able to harbor, harbor uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus for many days uh, to prevent the spread of the virus to other captive mink, i.e. other livestock. Um, so that's what I had for uh, federal regulatory work. Uh, and with that, I'll end my presentation and turn it over to Hannah. Thanks so much, Zach. Let me also just pull up my PowerPoint really quickly. All right, I think we should be good to go. Uh, so thanks again, everybody. And thank you, Edward. As you said, my name is Hannah Connor. I am a senior attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. Today, I am gonna be talking about um, pretty much what remains, which is the regulation and oversight of mink at the state level. Uh, you'll see some of that intersects with the federal issues that Zach was just discussing, but we're gonna make sure that that doesn't overlap with additional information so that you don't just get the same information again. So first, um, we got a little preview into this, but a sneak peek behind why the center as an environmental wildlife conservation organization is committing resources to fighting fur farming operations, which are more traditionally considered to be animal welfare or cruelty issues. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that, uh, but the two main ones are one, to address and ideally prevent the spread of disease as we've been discussing from these fur farming operations into wild populations. And then the second is related to the environmental contamination and harm to ecosystems that are caused by these operations. So starting with the second first to break us out from the zoonotics conversation we've mostly been having for the last 45 minutes. As you may already be aware, the factory farming of animals such as pigs, chickens, cows for human use and consumption has created and continues to create an environmental nightmare. These operations are major contrib contributors to water and air pollution, drivers of climate change, causes of deforestation and destruction of native habitats. And um, please excuse my shameless plug, um, but a cause of significant harm associated with the use of toxic agricultural pesticides like glyphosate and dicamba for the purpose of growing row crops that are fed to these confined animals. As further detailed, in this very report that came out last week, uh, that came out via my organization, Center for Biological Diversity and the World Animal Protection. What you may not realize is that the practices used for commercial farming of fur-bearing animals, so holding significant numbers of animals, thousands to hundreds of thousands in confinement where food is brought to those animals rather than foraged, and then accumulated feces and waste otherwise create a wastewater stream that must be disposed of, often cause many of the same environmental harms, including air and water pollution. It's for that reason, for example, that fur bearing operations can be categorized as concentrated animal feeding operations known more colloquially as factory farms um, and may require a Clean Water Act National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System or NIPDES permit, uh, which is often associated with point sources, which include concentrated animal feeding operations. In fact, Clean Water Act permits, which create enforceable restrictions themselves for the amount of pollution and an operation is allowed to discharge into waterways, are often one of the few ways in which these operations may be subject to more substantive state oversight. And even then, only a very few states have been that have been delegated with these authority actually require these permit forming farming operations. Um, I'll also identify here, this is one of those federal state overlaps for dealing with a federal statute that has been delegated authority to a state to be able to implement and enforce. And it's those states that end up choosing 
who or what ends up within this regulatory structure and this permitting program. But for example, a state that does require NIPTES permits for at least a subset of fur bearing operations is Oregon, uh, which requires CAFO permits for a fur farm if the animals are held in confinement and the wastewater storage or the waste is, is held through a wastewater storage treatment or a land applied. Oregon currently has 10 uh, NIPTES permits issued to fur bearing operations in the state, though public records indicate that only about five of those facilities may currently be operating, a number that's down by one from just last year. The largest of the permitted operations that continues to operate as a mink facility is permitted at about 110,000 animals though it appears from public records that that operation is currently operating at significantly reduced populations. The second largest is at 66,000 animals. So again, reemphasizing the size of these operations. And that one is believed to be operating at near the size that it is permitted for. And just to get a snapshot of what that means in terms of pollution, what that means in terms of waste, uh, according to that second facility, that 66K facilities animal waste management plan, the animals generate approximately 233,000 gallons of solid waste and 291,000 gallons of liquid waste a year. That solid waste is exported offsite. It is unclear to whom. That is not in the regulations or any of the public records. Um, whereas the liquid wastes are applied on surrounding fields. And, and we touched on this briefly, I believe. Um, and it's a good segue back into the zoonotics, but what we've seen with COVID is that it itself can be spread through fecal material. And so if you have, for example, COVID that has broken out within a mink for farming operation, they land applied those waste products. We are creating a potential hazardous situation of those uh, viruses being introduced into the environment or as summarized by CDC, spillover of viruses from animals, including farmed animals to humans can occur through direct contact with infected animals, indirectly through animal products or their excretia. So that gets us to the second reason the center is working on these issues. Um, and I will not go into great detail because I think that my fellow colleagues have already shared this enough, but I'm just gonna reemphasize a few points. So, the spread of disease into wild populations is a significant concern of ours, as has already been shared, but bears repetition, is that um, American mink are a native species throughout the lower 48, as well as into Canada. So we're not talking about just a farm species, we're talking about a farm species that if it goes into wild populations, it shares the genetics with those wild populations. Because of this, the spread of disease and other harmful genetic traits may be that may be bred onto these uh, factory farms can end up into wild populations and affect not just what we have already discussed, American mink, but also other mustelids. And there are a significant number of mustelids that are also native throughout this country. Some of them are threatened endangered species like the critically endangered black-footed ferret uh, or in Oregon, the Humboldt Martin. So this is obviously a real concern for us as a wildlife conservation organization. But segueing into the actual topic at hand, um, unfortunately, much like at the federal level, besides the possible Clean Water Act permitting operations earlier discussed, there is currently very little substantive state oversight of the fur farming industry. And the state oversight that exists is minimal, patchwork, and disconnected from the actual operations of these facilities. So it's things like licensure. Um, that doesn't really monitor a day-to-day -day operation, doesn't make sure that key vulnerabilities are addressed and buttoned up. And none of these states require veterinary oversight. Such, limited further, um, such limitations further augment the ability of this industry to work in secrecy, uh, which gets back to the public records and public information that Zach was talking about, and outside of the more standard regulatory oversight that you see with many other industries. So, for example, a critical state that experienced the spread of COVID in its mink populations included from a captive population to wild mink, and that still maintains a sizable farming industry is Utah. Utah has no regulations on farming for animals of fur in the state. 
And as was documented in a recent New York Times Magazine article, uh, an article that I would strongly recommend that you read if you are interested in this subject matter. She said, in internal, internal correspondence uh, acquired through public records requests, Utah Health Department officials discussed an infected farm that the department was not permitted to access, even for testing. Unregulated, secretive mink farms, Han, who, who is a specialist in this area, says, are, quote, not that different, if you think about it, from the captive wildlife farms that we hear about in other areas where the discussion of those key vulnerabilities are kind of first and foremost within the conversation at this point. But recognizing the critical public health and wildlife and biodiversity issues, um, a number of states have mobilized over the past few years in an effort to move forward legislation and or administrative regulations to address this gaping hole in state and federal oversight. So starting with legislation, beneficial for related bills tend to fall into two main camps at this point. There are fur production bills and fur sales bills. Fur sales bills have been introduced in numerous states over the past few years, including Oregon, Hawaii, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New York. And there have been some successes in these efforts with a majority of fashion companies now going for free, states like California and 10 US cities, including Boulder, Colorado, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and three towns in Massachusetts have banned fur sales. California, as this slide would indicate, being the first, uh, hopefully not the last. In addition to the fur sales bills, a number of fur farming prohibition bills have been recently run including in both Oregon and the state of Washington. In each case, these bills, which have garnered significant support, would phase out the farming of animals and complementary to what Kate was talking about, provide a means to set, uh, transition these farmers into other lines of business, make sure that they can move into something that's viable and not in this dying industry that is so problematic um, for so many reasons. Unfortunately, neither of the fur sales bill, including the Washington state one that was introduced this year, uh, have passed yet. But I am happy to share with you that just two days ago, a zoonotics and wildlife trafficking bill did pass in Oregon uh, that is linked to the import trade and handling of wildlife pro by prohibiting the import of wildlife um, that poses a risk to human health. Largely what this bill does is it says state agencies, you need to coordinate to identify key, key vulnerabilities within zoonotics and address those key vulnerabilities. So we do have some traction in this area and hopefully we're gonna continue to have it. Sadly, on the opposite end of the spectrum, we were just talking about Utah. Um, Utah introduced an animal enterprise protection bill earlier this week, I actually think it's been flying through their session. Uh, the House passed it yesterday and it's on the way to the Senate. If passed, the law would even further restrict the regulation of animal industries in the state by preempting cities and counties from passing any local laws that prohibit and, and prohibit animal enterprise. Um, and so basically we have a situation where we don't have regulations, so they're not really prohibiting that much, but it would put into place blockades in the event anybody did want to pass those regulations. We'll know by the end of the day if this specific bill passes. And I am running low on time, so I'm just going to speed through two really quick things. Uh, on the regulatory front, my organization petitioned the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Service to include American and European mink on the state's prohibited species list just last year. If successful, that petition would have banned the import possession sale purchase, exchange, or transport of European and American mink in Oregon. Uh, it also provided an exemption, however, that said that those things could occur. You could still have things like fur farms, for example, if six common sense standards were met. Those standards include minimizing escapes from the, of the prohibited species from where they were being contained, that adequate security and safety programs were put in place to ensure against escapes, adequate record keeping to ensure against mistakes and to track any, any escapes that might happen. Uh, adequate veterinary care, which as we discussed, is not required at all with this industry uh, to identify and minimize the spread of disease. 
And the applicant quote has to have a good reputation for care of animals and compliance with wildlife laws. Uh, unfortunately, that did not pass after hearing uh, public comment and some really, really, I think, impassioned pleas, uh, it didn't pass. But what it did show was uh, the very thing that Kate was discussing, which is this weird gray area that mink fall into, where they are both livestock and wild animals, and, and people don't seem to know what to do with it, and agencies don't seem to know what to do with that. And so we're going to keep on pushing to get them within a space where they don't fall between the cracks. But as this language, which was from the official minutes that were published show, um, they're in the cracks right now. And then I just one other thing to identify, which is what Zach was talking about. So I don't think we need to go too into depth on it. All of the efforts and work in Oregon did result in that temporary emergency provision being put in place which was supposed to require there to be vaccination of farmed mink by August of 2021. And that additional um, oversight provisions were put into place to be able to surveil any mink that might be going into uh, wild populations and causing harm within wild populations and or the spread of disease within these facilities themselves. I'm afraid that we still don't have any information about how successful this has been. Despite multiple requests to the state, uh, there is no telling if these um, mandates were actually complied with, but it is a step in the right direction and, and does track with the Stamps Act that Zach was discussing. And that's it for me. Um, I think that I'm gonna take us into Q&A with our last remaining minutes, but if anybody wants to ever chat about these things, Here's my contact information. Just let me know. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, really appreciate your guys' presentations. It was really insightful. Um, there are a couple of questions that we'll go ahead and lead off with. Um, and then if people want to, they can uh, go ahead and post uh, more questions in the Q&A. Um, so first, um, one of the things that we discussed initially in the panel was, um, you know, that there's, oh, uh, I'm starting to realize that we're kind of reaching the time limit here on our Zoom link. Um, I do believe there is another panel um, starting soon. Uh, I do. Edward, is, oh. Would it be possible for you to give our information to the participants and that way they can reach out with their questions? We'd be happy to answer them. Sure, if y'all can go ahead and um, forward that over to us, uh, we will go ahead and disseminate that information so that people, if they have any further questions, can go ahead and provide that. And again, Absolutely. thank you so much, y'all, for your presentation. Very enlightening. Y'all have a nice day. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thanks, everybody.